Okay. Just this thing here will go away, but anyway. Um, you know, software development, it's kind of, it's kind of like an art form almost. It's science and it's logic, but it's also a, a style. It's a lifestyle, it's an art form. You know, when I first created this course, oh, many, many years ago, um, I thought to myself, hey, this is great. I can, I can do this. I can teach the kids how to do a numerical solution to an ODE, and I can teach them how to really program. Well, I discovered that I'm pretty good at numerical solutions to ODEs. Yes, I can teach you that. You do this, you do the other thing. It's a procedure. In fact, it's complicated. It doesn't make any difference if you do this. But the logic of programming was very difficult. And part of the reason was I realized that even though I got the job done, obviously I got through school, did all my stuff, that I really lacked in some programming skills too. So my um, programming has greatly increased, the uh, skill level has greatly increased in just the experience of trying to teach this course. It's still difficult to define exactly what it is, but step one, oops, I don't want that, I don't want to go back there. Mm -hmm. Step one, develop the underlying logic of the program. And, and you do that before you start typing. I've seen so many students, they've got a task and they start pecking away at MATLAB, trying this, trying that. I guess they say a, a monkey can write a Shakespearean sonnet or something if you monkey around enough. What I do, I, I, ironically, and, and only then do you go to, only then do you go to program construction, where you start writing the program in the computer language of your choice, whether it's MATLAB or Mathematica or Fortran that I grew up on or C++ or whatever. Um, so many students go directly to this step without really giving this much thought. I personally, and as a result, what happens is students spend an excessive amount of sometimes frustrating time on this step two when they haven't done much on one. Ironically, I will spend typically more time on step one than the typical student than I get step two done in a fraction of the time. And it has partly to do, I monkey with it for you. I mean, since I've been programming computers for years, that's a head start on you also. That's not really a comparison. But I do spend more time thinking. So think of your, your plan, your logic. Let's see, talk it out to yourself. Write a flow chart or a pseudocode, which I'll talk about in a minute here. Write it down what your flow of events will be and then start to construct your program. You know, this and assign that and if that and while that and test the other thing, right? Of course, once you get it done, the debugging and testing, and that needs to be in stages. So you got a program to write, so you put in 112 lines and then press return and it doesn't work. Well, I'll be darned, who the thunk it, huh? You test everything, so you've got Say there's a command in MATLAB that you don't know exactly how to use it. You don't just test the whole program. You test that one line, that command, to make sure. And you've seen me even here. I'm trying to show you an example, and I wanted to use the RAN command, and I, oh, I didn't quite get it right, and I didn't do that on purpose. I just don't have that on my conscience. So, but I don't want to be a huge code, and who knows what's wrong. Um, if there's a command that I I'm not sure of the format, or I haven't I particularly, I've never used it. There. So, and then, of course, you, then you want to debug and test the whole thing, too. As you get the pieces designed and the pieces, pieces debug, you're going to go back. Notice that this is, you don't, you don't do one and you end, two and you end, three and you end. These things go back and forth. That is, you come up with a plan. Then you start to construct your program. And then as you can write your program, you might discover that, you know, oh, my thinking here wasn't quite as good. I need to go back and change my thinking slightly because I whatever and clearly the program construction should go in phases you you construct a part of it and you test it then you go back you know this is not a one this is a back and forth thing then when you're, you're along the way and finally should document things i've tried to document things for you guys because you're the students and i'm doing this i'm doing that and there's the sections and major sections this is hard to get a student to do and, and i know myself my computer is full of codes and the ones that are well documented if i haven't looked at them for a while and then pop them open i i like i need longer arms to pat myself on the bat back with this i say i say i say to myself i say self you did a really good job of documenting those things and i am so 
happy to take that time. On the contrary, on my computer, you can find codes that are not well documented. For whatever reason, I got lazy. I don't know what happened. Bad boy. And I go, what the hell did I do here? Has everybody, anybody ever done that? Gone back and looked at their old work from last semester or last year or something and, and go, God, what the hell was this? What did I do here? So documentation is extremely important just for yourself, but also if you're working on a company, if you work on a, a design team, your other design of people have to understand what you're doing. Documentation is hugely important. And so then, and then this is something you won't do, you would do at a professional storage and maintenance would be something um, if you again were working for uh, Microsoft or if you were working for a, a big engineering firm and you wanted your code to be used in the future, stuff like that. But certainly these first four steps should be taken seriously, including the documentation. Mm -hmm. Modular design, break large problems into smaller logical ones. Now you hopefully have a software that can do that. And MATLAB, I grew up with something called subroutines in, in Fortran. Fortunately, MATLAB has a way to break smaller, to break big difficult problems into smaller pieces. And it's called the function M file. So, I mean, you can get by without it, just like you can do things extremely inefficiently. And, but nobody, all the good programs will tell you, break difficult problems into smaller logical sub pieces using function M files. I can't remember a year or two ago, I was talking to one of these graduate students and, and, and you know, he was using MATLAB and like struggling with it and, and, and well, but he, you know, he claimed, oh, I've, I got all my work done and, and you know, and I'm, I'm really good with MATLAB, but I, I don't use function M files. Well, he was doing things inefficiently and he was very misconstrued, misconceived because he, he told me he's really good with MATLAB. No, he sucked at MATLAB. I mean, period. They weren't using function M files. And there's no other way. No, there's no nicer technical way to say it. You know. Anyway, these modules should be as independent and self-contained as possible. That is, they should stand on their own, they, on on their by themselves. For instance, we're going to get into these solvers. One of the most famous ones we're going to use. Second half of the second uh, last third of the course. ODE four five. It's a state of the art ordinary differential equation solver. You will know how to do that. You didn't write it. The professional programmers at MATLAB wrote it. But anyway, the, the point is, it's a standalone program. It's got definitive inputs and definitive outputs. And that's the only way you can get into it. And it's the only way you can get out of it. So and then a calling or main program orchestrates the pieces. Modular design makes it easier to debug and test the just this whole stream of consciousness of a hundred lines and press return and there's an error just drives me nuts. You've got to break his things into logical tasks so that you, when you do make an error, if you're anything like me, my God, um, you have some sensible way to find what the error is and, and to, to, to find what the details of the error was. So you can correct it, not just some, oh, God knows. Anyway, and your program maintenance, again, that's probably a more of a professional thing. So break hard problems into easier tasks with tools, like the function M files are like tools to do specific things. And then your job will be to call on the different tools at your disposal to do the specific job. Top down design, a systematic um, development where you start with the most general, that is my objective is to do such and such and successfully divide it into the detail you need to accomplish. I want to design the space shuttle. Okay, let's see, let's break it down into the booster rockets and the fuselage, and then even there needs breaking down. And eventually you're an engineer who works working on the, um, the special hinges on the door, you know. Um, the space shuttle is a little too exciting, way too much, but you know, you break hard problems from the top down to easy ones and then structure your program. Make, make it as easy to understand as possible with a prescribed set of rules. Now, this algorithm development or, you know, your plan, your plan, you know, don't just go pecking around, um, either through a flowchart or a pseudocode, almost like pseudocode. The flowchart is that 
classical bunch of little pictures, you know, the little boxes and the little diamonds and junk that you do whatever it's in. But a pseudocode is kind of like a loose English statement, but logical on how to do it. And I, I grew up, they taught me this, but I kind of almost like this, but both are, both are good. Um, but to plan out your work is really critical. So on this mundane example, what you want to do here is add two numbers. So, I mean, you think to yourself, well, I begin, you know, I begin and an end. Like, let's see, I need to add two numbers. So I need to tell the computer the two numbers. I need to figure out how to add them and output. So in flowchart form, here it would be, or there's a beginning and an end. Make sure there's a beginning and end, everyone. And so, and this little, this is the classic indicator of an input in computer language. But you input the A and the B. The box is a, a some kind of a something to do. You add them and store it as the thing called C, and then you output C. So that's your little flowchart. In pseudo form, you sort of I'll be begin my code called adder. I like to do these indents. You input A and B. This needs to be assigned. Put C, and then you plant C. So this example is almost too simple to. I mean. If, if, if this is all you ever needed to do, I mean, why bother? But as you know, things, even now in our course, things are quite a bit more complex, like the beam, right? You gotta know, you gotta push on the beam and you gotta know whether you're on the, on the left side or right side, you know, you got some statements to make, you got some things to do. So to plan out your, your strategy. And I know sometimes students, they just are not gonna plan things. I can remember a couple of some years ago, back in the days when students could actually come to my office, you know, and actually sit and talk to me, you know, remember the good old days? It's ironic, I get, you know, 150 students or 400 students, I've never physically seen any of them. It's just, you know, whatever. But anyway, kid's sitting here and he's having trouble with this stuff, Matt Lab, and says he's all frustrated. He says, stupid Matt Lab, I know exactly what I'm doing. I just Matt Lab with the syntax and he's sort of slamming his mouse down and all the things and the poor desk was taking a beating. I said, okay, well, you know, you claim, okay, you say you know the theory perfectly, you just have trouble. Well, tell me in English, tell me in English what you will. Let's assume that Matt Lab could have a, um, English interpreter, so that you say the words and it makes the computer language and puts all the syntax. Tell me what you would say to it, just in English. Well, the, and what it turned out was he, the kid had no idea what he was doing. I mean, he just was slamming the, slamming the computer around. I mean, his, his idea that he understood the problem was totally fictitious. He had no idea. He had no plan, no idea how to do the science, no idea. And, and you know, so don't, don't take it out on that lab. Poor Matt, Matt lab is the dumbest thing in the world. It's just a bunch of yeses or noes put together in a very sophisticated way. So to say stupid Matt Lab, Matt Lab and slam your computer doesn't get you anywhere. Um, and most of y'all don't do that. But I've seen, you know, many students do that kind of thing. Mm, whatever. Okay, fundamental control here. I leave Jason some time here. Well, 30, okay. The fundamental controls, sequence, just do some things, selection, this, this, that, and repetition. The four and the while are two, the two repetition loops, that, and we've described where each one probably has its advantage. Any numerical algorithm actually is some combination of doing things, selecting things, and repeating. So a sequence, do things one, two, three, you know, that's a sequence. A selection is you have a condition. If it's true, do one thing, if it's false, do another thing and then continue on down the road. That's your if statement. And here's your repetition statement. You have a condition. If that condition is true, you perform the tasks at hand, up the condition somehow. If then suddenly, if you then came to a loop where that condition uh, evaluated as false and you are done, you go on to keep whatever else you need to be doing. All codes are a combination of those. And I found this definition which is sort of abstract. An exact definition of structured programming is difficult in just the same way that, as I was described my experience that, you know, I was excited to teach this course. I'm gonna teach this, these students to be logical and good programmers. And I discovered that I wasn't that good. And 
I discovered that's the most difficult thing I've ever tried to teach. To teach the details of some complicated mathematical method is easy compared to how do you be logical? Logical, how do you be an artist? But the static structure that is spread out on the page of the problem should correspond in a simple way to the dynamic structure that is spread out in time. That was an official you know, computer scientist abstraction, but it, it kind of makes sense, I think. So, some general guidelines. The program should consist of just the three statements, the three, 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 three fundamental control structures. Now, MATLAB has, have, with its vectorization, has very sophisticated ways of doing them. When you vectorize, when you take a matrix and you take the sign of the whole matrix, you're really doing four, one to the nut length of the da da da. But it's just that MATLAB will allow you to do it in a very uh, structured way. So when it's vectorizing, it's doing behind the scenes, you know, these three things, it's, it's doing the loop. And, and in your, your programs, you should only have, in your, especially your sub-programs, your M files, you only have one end and one exit. Now this is probably obsolete. Back when I used to have these unconditional go-tos and do loops and all this stuff, I think those things aren't allowed in MATLAB, at least I hope they're not. It just like it allows for spaghetti coding, you know, and literally, I've seen students like generally as a general rule, the length of the code is in is inversely proportional to the quality of the code. That is, a short logical code tends to be a much better code than a long elaborated thing. I've seen codes where you know I did it in ten lines. I got some students with 200 lines and this and that got just all tied knots and his arms are different ways. It just reminded me of a bowl of spaghetti all this rather than look, you need to do this and pass the variable there and do the other thing and then you're done. I mean, what is, well, this and that and the other thing. So spaghetti-like code. Now that's not an absolute statement, but generally the quality of your code and the quality of your logic is inversely proportional to its length general. So, I mean, this is the way you come. You begin the main or driver program. Now, in other words, my task is to, to, to solve the beam problem. I want to solve this problem I've assigned for homework, the beam, you know. And to do it, I said, I need to do this, 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 the other thing. Now, task three is quite a bit to do. It seems kind of complicated. So let me make a little function M file a sub program to do because because task three is quite difficult right it's it's a lot to do so let me let me draw, create a little function m file to do that specifically and then return the value so i can keep my flow fairly straight here now within that there may be even another task in here that's kind of like that task is so it might call on another sub program some kind of solver or something etc so this is the way you build a code you got logical steps where some of the steps like step five, task five is quite complex and it may make sense to make an ODE solver or an algebra solver or a root finder to do its thing and come back and return the thing to the main flow. So the main program, see, this program is like a symphony orchestra. There's a violin and there's a oboe and there's a various the pieces, right? So the conductor, and this is like the conductor of the orchestra. Now, there's one, you know, the orchestra has all the pieces that make sounds, like the violins and all this stuff. But there's one major component of the orchestra that doesn't make noise, and it's the conductor. The conductor raises his little thing, and he calls on the various tasks, he calls on the violins to come in, and he calls on this, that, and the other habit. So the driver program is like the orchestrating program, of which behind this, sitting there at his disposal, it's all the instruments and tools to call on by themselves, might not be too good and played independently it would sound like crap they'd all be playing different songs but with a main driving program like this you can call on them and you can make a beautiful symphony orchestra in the hands of a skilled conductor and with skilled with skilled technicians and the best symphony orchestras you know each individual musician is a very skilled musician but the, but by themselves they're nothing without the conductor calling upon them properly so it's like a symphony orchestra I know it sounds kind of abstract, but really that a good program is like that. So like a beautiful symphony. Um, 
So quality control, extensive debugging is required. Um, there's sort of four levels here. The syntax, and, and, and they're in order of their difficulty. The, the syntax errors are easy to get out. Like it comes back and line 37 is missing a parenthesis. What's my error? The damn parenthesis in line 37. So those are the easy ones to get out, okay? I mean, they're annoying, but they're easy. The link or build errors. And you know, I ran out a few of those. Like, like, I don't know this, you're calling on a function, I don't know about it. Oh, whoops, you know, I either haven't created it or haven't linked to it properly. My code just can't recognize a, one, of the, one of the musicians I wanna call on. Whoops, he's out drunk somewhere in the bar. Get a new one there. Runtime errors, these, these get to be more difficult because now the thing runs, all the, all the syntax is corrected, knows all the files, but it's just not working right. In other words, you've probably got something like it crashes because it divides by zero. Whoops, I better do that. And then, and then, but those generally, you can find those. Now, the last thing is the hard part. It works, you got no division by zero, it knows all the functions and it gets numbers, but the numbers are ridiculous or wrong. And there you've got some logic problem. And there tends to be the more difficult errors to get rid of because it's logic. I mean, I, so what the heck, I gotta start again, right? Okay, so you, you should proceed and you should test each little detail, test the whole thing, the whole system. What this is saying is, you, like I've been trying to tell you, you test each line to make sure it works, and then each, each subroutine or, or M file. Test pieces of the code to put the whole thing together. Don't write 100 lines of code and press return. It never works. Documentation and maintenance. Um, okay, let me sort of skip over those. Those, we maybe go back and look at that if you're actually working for a company, this is one thing. But even for yourself, like I said, just let me say about this, even for your own computer, even if you don't show, tend to show it to anyone else, document your work or else it's very difficult to, later on, you'll be glad you did. I've, I've always been very proud of myself and I've always been very, been cursed myself for not documenting a code when it was fresh on my mind. So you, what the hell's wrong with you? Um, here's just some of the languages we've worked with. Um, I love Mathematica and MATLAB. I love these two environments. I grew up with these others, and, I don't know, Visual Basic and things. And let me just end this talk by an interesting tidbit. You know, we talk about a bug. Well, that was a, a term coined by Admiral Grace Hopper, and she was a pioneer of computer languages. So the story goes, in 1945, she was working with one of those early electromagnetic computers, where literally there were relays, right, a physical, thing connect, the physical electrical connection hit to make the connection and pulled away. They didn't have transistors and stuff. A huge room with all these relays and all these trans, and all these little electromagnetic things. And literally it was a physically a huge room full of stuff and it was nowhere near as powerful as this machine I'm working on now or your cell phone. But anyway, one day it wasn't working evidently. She opened it, she took her screwdriver, opened up the back back and there was a moth stuck in one of the relays so the signal was not getting through. That was, that's why the signal was not getting through, a moth was stuck in there. So evidently in her logbook she put down it had a bug. She removed the moth, evidently the thing worked and somehow somebody saw in her logbook that she called it a bug so it just kind of stuck. You know, like that's why a bug, an error is called a bug. Why was it called a bug, you know? But anyway, Admiral Grace, I think she died a few years ago but she was a she was one of the early, I mean, I think she was one of the first admirals in the United States Navy, women, women admirals. And uh, you know, back then to, back in 1945, to be a, a woman admiral, she was probably a cut above, the, probably a cut above the men there, almost certainly, but uh, she was pretty, it reminds me of my grandmother who worked for the Navy for a while and she was kind of uppity and she, Anyway, she was a civilian, she wrote books for them and she wrote manuals and stuff and the way she, one day she told one of those admirals to go do something to himself or some, some language they won't repeat and I think she got fired. But anyway, um, <clears throat> it was tough back then, you know. Anyway, Admiral Grace is an interesting story. If you look at her story, Admiral Grace Hopper. So anyway, that's it, there we go. Um, Jason's gonna tell you about the, um, we got about 20, 20 some minutes. Jason's gonna tell you about the, uh, project now. This, this my little talk is over. And this is on the internet under files and programming if you want to look at this thing again.
So with that, I'm going to turn this thing over to Jason. I'm going to stop share. And Jason, you ready to go, bud? This is, he's going to tell you about the project. Yeah, so before I start talking about the project, I just want to elaborate on some of the things here. And I have my own personal story with this. So in my opinion, if there's one slide from the entire slideshow that you need to take away, it's this one right here, sort of outlining the entire software design process. So when I was um, the summer after my sophomore year of undergrad, I interned for a company and I came in at the start of a 10 month project. Um, my job was to build um, a software suite that would sort of um, take all the data that we were getting from a sensor suite we were developing and do a bunch of processing. And when I turned in the first iteration of my MATLAB code to my boss, he took one look at it and basically rejected it because I didn't have enough documentation. And I had maybe in the like 200 line MATLAB code I wrote, I had maybe five lines of comments. And he said, the ratio of comments to code needs to be at least one to one. So that 200 line code ended up being about 800 lines later. So my ratio of comments to code was about three to one um, because he said that two weeks after my summer internship ended, they were getting a co-op student for the fall. And that student was gonna be continuing right where I left off. So he needed to understand exactly how my code worked with no hesitation because I wouldn't be available to answer any questions about the code. So long story short, um, the bulk of your work won't necessarily be writing it, it's gonna be documenting it and testing it. And these are two really important, but um, incredibly overlooked steps that if you take the work, if you take the time to do the work now, it's gonna serve you a lot better in the future. You know, one of the goals that we preach in this class is to give you a skill set, um, that skill set being both algorithmic thinking and physical MATLAB codes that you can use in your future classes. So if you take the time to document your codes now, two years later, when you're taking vibrations and controls and you see a differential equation and you know, your homework problem is use this MATLAB command to solve it, well, guess what? You can go back to this class and you know, who knows when you might be taking that class, but if you have documented your code well, you can go back two years from now or maybe a year and a half and say, I, I remember exactly what I did because I can just read the comments and I understand how this code works. And so every semester when I start this class, I make a folder called useful functions, which I copy and paste all the, the standalone functions uh, all the numerical tools and stuff that I've used and can carry over with me from one semester to the other. So that way, whenever we get to a unit in this class, such as the root finding unit, I, I can pull up a bunch of these root finding method codes easily and they're all incredibly well documented. So it takes me no effort now to open up one of these codes and say, oh, I remember exactly how that's used. And you know, I have two iterations of this thing called newton raphson which we're gonna learn in about a month. And so off the top of my head, I don't remember what the difference is between these two. But all I have to do is open up both of them in MATLAB, read the first probably 10 lines of the code and say, oh, okay, this is the difference between newton raphson and newton raphson 2. And so it should probably be a little more descriptive with these names, but internally inside the code, I've built enough documentation to know exactly what I did without any hesitation. 